Friday we have got a empathetic speaker on uh, farm boy, farm vet. I've been involved with the clients and we sort of see things a little bit as they are. Um, I've been elected president of the New Zealand Federation of Freshwater Anglers for the last few years, but I've been involved in this water angling issue since about 2007 when I was working on the West Coast and I was asked to become a West Coast Regional Councillor to get involved with an assessment of environmental effects because the farmer client knew that I'd done a fish feed course in Scotland along with my many other crops. So science and water quality, defining problems and seeing things as they are is, is the way I'm sort of like. So I found this um, statement on Google, getting ready for the talk, and I think it pretty much sums up um, my political views. Irrigation has contributed greatly to Canterbury's economy. Irrigation has also contributed greatly to the region's water pollution and degraded ecosystems. The New Zealand Federation of Festival Anglers runs a website, nzfpo.com, we're a bit of outspoken, but we see ourselves as a legitimate ginger group, so we pop a number of articles on our web page for public consumption. We're not fishing game, we're, we're, we're independent, and we're nationally spread across New Zealand. And so I've popped a pot of history of Canterbury's water as I see it, if anybody's interested, with a bit of politics, a bit of science, a bit of everything else. So irrigation can cease to affect other water users. When water, which is held in common, is abstracted for private profit, the consequences for other affected parties must be considered. Whether it's standard water management strategy, vision and principles, or whether it's the RMA, the first priority should be for the environment. Irrigation is a second order priority. Consents, in my view, should be viewed as a privilege and not a right. Environment Canterbury Temporary Commissioners and Improved Water Management Act 2010 has achieved its purpose of growing Canterbury's economy by opening up the region's water to privatisation of irrigation. The ECAN Act has led to pollution and over abstraction of the region's once heavily fresh water resource. The ECAN Act has cost the region its democracy and trust in central and regional government. You'll be familiar with Ken in Cathedral Square. And I don't know if the ECAN has been repealed, but I think that's the first step. We want fair link and water conservation orders. We want access to the Environment Court, and we don't want the press water managed by the water zone committees of water users. <laughs> so I've framed my talk around Section 30 of the RMA which defines the functions of regional councils. I'll put it in a simple form. ECAN has an obligation to control land use, to maintain and enhance the region's fresh water quantity, quality and ecosystems. Presently, the Canterbury region has the greatest area of land under irrigation of any region in New Zealand about half a million hectares according to Statistics New Zealand. Large areas of the aquifers beneath the Canterbury Plains are now red zone due to over allocation of water and due to unacceptably high levels of nitrate pollution. Surface waters are becoming increasingly polluted with waterborne pathogens from cattle feces. ECAN has successfully managed the recent irrigation development undemocratic consent processes thanks to targeted legislation, the ECAN Act 2010. ECAN is failing to sustainably manage our region's fresh water. Over allocation of Canterbury surface and groundwater for irrigation has led to lower groundwater levels and the degradation and dewatering of many once permanent lowland rivers and streams. The recreational fisheries of many of Canterbury's lowland rivers have been lost. The Lower Selwyn River has seen trout numbers in the past, which counts up to 200,000 fish for less than 20. 
Anglers have lost heavily from the conversion of much of Canterbury into a variegated, intensive dairy platform. So going back to the section 30 of the Econ Act, water quantity. That's the Earl River, once a great little fishery. And these are the drains across the Selwyn water zone that I measure nitrate on a monthly basis. The New Zealand Pub Tariff has brought us a state-of-the-art trials optical sensor and I can measure nitrate with precision and I've been doing so for the last 21 months. Here's the justification for Central Plains Water Enhancement was lifting the aquifer. Uh, this is the Selwood River uh, yesterday at Chamberlain's Ford. I don't think the Selwood Plains Water Enhancement is doing much for our river. We'll move to water quality. So now we have toxic algae, waterborne pathogens, excess nutrients, toxic nitrate levels, sediment, and high water temperatures. Nitrate leaching is destroying our recreational fisheries. From my nitrate testing, average monthly nitrate level in the Selwyn River at Chamberlain's Ford, this is August 2020 to March 21, is 9.5 milligrams per litre nitrate in. Nitrate levels from 3.5 to 6.5 are lethal to trout eggs and fry. Trout can no longer reproduce in once prolific fisheries, such as the Hines and Selwyn rivers, due to direct nitrate toxicity. Because of the talk today, I thought I'd measure the water yesterday on Easter Monday. That's only for 9.97 milligrams per litre. The Ministry of Environment's guidelines for ECAN, the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management Bottom Line, is 2.4. And even that's a pragmatic political compromise. 14 out of the 19 scientists on the Scientific Technical Advisory Group said it should be one. Waikiri Kiri, or River of Stones, is the Maori name for the Selwyn River. The stones are now coated with toxic algae, slime, or filamentous algae, and two metre high macrophytes grow hydroponically on the shingle overlying the nutrient rich groundwater. It's basically fertigation that's going on. Toxic algae, macrophytes, slime. We've degraded ecosystems, not just the lowland rivers like the Selwyn and many other Canterbury intermittent lowland rivers, but our lowland lakes, our braided rivers, our aquifers, and even the coastal waters are compromised by irrigation. Lake Elsie yesterday, the figures are a wee bit different, but the national policy statement bottom line is about 7 to 800, so we're well over that. Sadly, Tiwa Horus is a receiving vessel for the Central Plains of Tusa Farm. Canterbury's iconic braided rivers are degraded through excess water extraction. Nobody understands braided rivers. Um, you know, I really made an effort to make a submission against the changing of the required conservation order of 2012. The scientific expert, the evidence, was little better than expert opinion. But braided rivers are complex, they're dynamic, and they're defined by variable flows. When minimum flows are seen as a target by irrigators, the braid beds are affected. We get invasion of weeds, we get sediment, filling the spaces between the stones, it's all like apartment buildings for all the insect life. Fish food sources and fish sporting habitat is lost. Worse, because the rivers can no longer function carry the sediment from the southern Alps to the coast, and we're losing coastal armour. He can annually defoliate the braid beard braided rivers to remove invasive weeds. This kills up to 40% of the soil ecology. It kills the terrestrial insects juvenile salmon rely on so they might migrate to sea. It destroys the channel structure, the back backwaters and shelter where young salmon grow, and it releases fine sediment from the islands, that were once willow trees and brewing God knows where else, and this kills smelt eggs and fry. ECAN's mitigation is harming our salmon fishery. This is the sort of thing we get on the river beach. They've just done in the North Branch the other day. Sediment released from defoliation results in the deposition of mud, 
with album mats on the brave bed rather than clean fresh shingle. Mud and rushes that have placed shingle beaches around the lagoon. So fish and aquatic insects are replaced by mid and snails. The peritidal zone, where stock will smelt, mature is fallen, becomes smothered in a layer of fine sediment and mud. Not breeding habitat anymore. These guys uh, are fundamental to a chap like me that fish the river mountains, the food source there within Peru. So after about three years of agitating, me were he can and fishing game and having a look to see if there's any left. We still haven't had the report. Stockwell smelt got on the international red list of endangered species. This was initially due to their regional restriction because they were restricted to just a handful of Canterbury's greater rivers from the Waitaki River to the North Canterbury Wire. They were, until recently, the largest fishery by mass at the mouths of the Rangitana, Ashburton and the Kai rivers. These fish fed the fish and breeding gull and turn colonies of the Harpoor Zone, which is Harpoor River. In less than a decade, these fish have declined from massive shoals to a handful of fish. So this is the outcome. black billed gulls on the endangered species list and starving in non-fledging chicks is common. About three years ago, I went down to the camera when the black billed gulls left. I divided the tent for the nest had a dead mummified chick in the nest. Our sea trout are a shadow of what they used to be. But it's fewer, they're smaller, and being a bit of a fish bed, I always have four tops of few that I keep, and they're pretty much always in. Occasionally we might get a torrent fish, which is one of the major fish in the vast water of Canterbury Brady Rivers, might be New Zealand sprat. And I think this year I found two smelt, whereas in the 90s I counted over 70, which was spewing out of a single trout. So this is what we had. I don't think we'll come back. The other thing that nobody's looked at, the low swimming plume along the coast of the river mouth acts as the estuary for Canterbury's greater rivers. Now if we're taking out most of the water, we're taking out most of the estuary. So there's obviously going to be implications for coastal fisheries. A um, bit political, but we've mentioned our environment plans. In my opinion, they simply delay and defer solutions to Canterbury's freshwater crisis. Rather than push restoration into the future, the time to take action now. There's no scientific evidence that these environment plans are valid. But they're a political compromise of what's convenient. Most of the nitrate leaching comes from carrier. So good manufacturing practice, of which the environment plans are based on, and limiting urea to 190 kilograms of urea annually might slow, but it will not reduce the nitrate pollution on the ground. The European Union has had good management practice-based regulations since 1991. A 2018 audit found nitrate in groundwater had still increased, while nitrate in surface water had plateaued and they don't have 1.2 million cows peeing on the most vulnerable soils that you can have. Our cow numbers, as Mike Joy says, are not sustainable. I've reported a number of things that you can over the time. This is a farmer moving the brave beds around in a river with the National Conservation Order. You know, waste your breath. So we get back to the bowel cancer. Well, interestingly enough, we've used our optical sensor to test a fairly small number of wells in, uh, in Canterbury for rural residents. About 40% of the samples exceed the half the MAB. And interestingly, a number of countries around the world are starting to adopt 5 milligrams rather than 11.3 as their maximum standard. About 8% of the samples that we tested exceeded the New Zealand MOD of 11.3 milligrams per litre. And from the small sample of less than 200 well samples, we had a number of well owners 
quietly say that they, or at least one family member, has cancer. Now, one swallow doesn't make a spring, but um, there's food for thought. The other thing that was quite striking was that mothers with young children are particularly anxious about the possibility of high nitrate levels of drinking water affecting their families. Dairy factory waste is another one that has been reasonably well hidden. We've used our optical sensors to measure nitrate levels for a small rural community in Waikato, where a farm terra factory had applied factory waste to farmland. A cluster of cancers had resulted among residents with higher results, but the community will not release the details as many plan to sell up and move, and they fear their property values will fall if this information is made public. I have fished Canterbury's freshwater recreational fisheries for 62 years. I've retired to the Rakaia Huts with a view to spending my retirement fishing the once abundant runs to fit superbly conditioned sea trout. My trips to the river have become fewer and fewer as I watch the once nationally and internationally recognised salmon and trout fisheries decline. A long treasured space has become a place of sadness and loss. Thanks to short-term greed and mismanagement by regional central governments, future generations will not experience the Rakai River as I have. We don't do this stuff on your own, as Water Rights Trust, Mike Joy, and all these chaps uh, are fighting actively on your behalf. One thing that does, if anything, irritates me is to hear councillors say that Canterbury's night track pollution was unforeseen. But the ECAN's got records of reports going back to the 80s, and the first report I've seen was a master's thesis from a Lincoln student in 1974 working on the Eastern Bay. Thank you.